Um, should I share the slides, Amy, so that we can go through the um, webinar contact, uh, contents and so on? So let yes. me just see. There we go. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're really excited to share with you um, some of the work we've been doing and to hear from some amazing scholars from um, across the world. So if you'll go to the next slide, Mia, um, just wanted to give you first a little overview of the webinar. Yeah, there it is, sorry. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, so parenting, of course, is stressful and can be challenging across many contexts. And it's made even more difficult when families face financial insecurity or poverty, racism, discrimination, and other systemic stressors. Countries employ varied approaches to address economic and social issues, and um, yet families continue to face inequities right across the globe. So Mia and I have been collaborating around exploring the approaches that Finland and the United States employ to support families facing economic insecurity. And we're gonna start the webinar by sharing a little bit about that with you today. And then we've invited um, some other scholars to share about other stressors families face and the ways in which country and other contextual factors are shaping families' abilities to navigate towards resources and resilience. So we have Anita Jaga here today, um, as well as Anna uh, Kuroska and Sharday Smith. Um, so they'll all present uh, after Mia and I do. And you can move to the next slide, me, unless you have anything to add there. <laughs> okay, so first we'll share a little bit um, about kind of our work exploring um, supports for families in poverty in Finland and the United States. And you can move forward. Uh, so we're approaching this webinar and our examination of policies in Finland and the U.S. from a systemic perspective. And uh, really we're drawing from ecological systems theory and family systems theory as we think about how sociocultural context shapes the lives of families. Um, so it, it shapes internal relationship dynamics, couple and family uh, functioning, and in turn, individual well-being, family well-being. Um, and there's certainly a large body of research that indicates the sociocultural context, things like politics and laws and policies, the pandemic, systemic oppression, um, community and regional policies, neighborhoods, et cetera, impact family dynamics and the experiences of couples, parents, and that in turn shapes family members' well-being. And of course, systemic theories view these relationships as bi-directional and cyclical. So individuals also shape families' dynamics and families impact the broader cultural norms and ultimately policies um, and politics. So if you can go to the next slide, Mia. Um, just to provide a couple of examples of this, um, in my own area, I mostly study um, the transition to parenthood. And so we know that sociocultural stressors really impact parents' experience in the transition to parenthood and especially shape co-parenting and couple relationship dynamics. Uh, pandemic stressors in particular, something I've been studying in the last couple of years, are linked uh, to reports of poor co-parenting and also less access to friends and family support, which in turn um, is related to higher risk of maternal depression. And um, I think throughout, we wanna talk a lot about intersectional considerations and that <clears throat> the pandemic, for instance, hasn't impacted all families in the same way. Some families have more you know, intersectional privilege and are able to navigate towards resources um, easier. And then um, similarly, many studies demonstrate a link between socioeconomic disadvantage, so being low income, young, unmarried, low education, and how that's related to challenges in co-parenting relationships, which in turn are associated with risk of child development issues. So today um, we're going to focus in on economic insecurity and how the U.S. and Finland approach addressing economic insecurity at a policy level. Um, country level policies and supports are clearly only one piece of the sociocultural context, and that's only one piece of the complicated interplay between economic insecurity, family dynamics, and individual outcomes and well being. And we hope through the other presentations today, we'll get kind of some of the other pieces of the puzzle. We can move forward. Okay, just a few words on the, um, on the background still. 
Uh, so when we talk about high risk context or vulnerability, what we want to highlight that um, it should not be taken as something that is given. In a way, it's always produced and as as a produced uh, kind of factor, it can also be kind of um, er eradicated or uh, we can get rid of it. So um, this is some a starting point for um, for our work with Amy. Um, I, then I just took one sort of definition of what a vulnerability is that is kind of described as the capacity to be wounded um, can be, for example, lack of resources or social weakness. Um, in our uh, presentation today, it's mostly um, economic vulnerability. So families living in poverty, um, they might be coupled with other sources of, of risks or vulner vulnerabilities or not. Um, and then also just to highlight that it is important that we don't um, kind of pr produce ideals of parenting that might be very difficult for certain um, people living in certain situations to meet. So it's um, it, it's important that we don't kind of create deviance or kind of unnormality. Um, yeah, I think that's it for, for this slides. I'm sorry, my cursor keeps on disappearing. That's why it's very slow for me to, to find where it is. There it is. And now I notice that I'm, when I'm presenting my, my, I'm sharing my screen, I don't see if anyone has been, is in, if anyone is in the, um, in the waiting room. So if you can ch just check that. Yeah. Now I find my cursor now. There we go. Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so first we want to share a little bit about the differences in social policy context in Finland and the United States. And uh, Finland and the U.S. represent traditionally very different places on the social welfare philosophy continuum. So we have them on two ends of the continuum here. And uh, you'll hear today some about how these two countries might be moving together or really Finland's kind of maybe moving towards the United States a little bit. Um, but there are still substantial differences and just philosophies around uh, social policy in these two countries. So the United States um, is classified as a liberal welfare regime. And in general, um, liberal welfare regimes provide fewer universal provisions. So no public child care, public health services, um, although we do have public compulsory schooling uh, through uh, high school. And um, individuals in this uh, liberal welfare regime are really expected to ensure their own well-being um, through employment and then to make private arrangements for contingencies should they become unable to work. So um, the United States philosophy is that uh, individuals should have their own insurance plans um, for in, in case something happens, they should have savings accounts. So if they were unemployed, they're able to kind of have their own safety net established. Um, and in the U.S., health insurance and other benefits are generally provided by employers rather than the state or universally. And so um, it's really important that you're employed in order to receive the benefits. Um, there is minimal state assistance available, and it's really viewed as a last resort for those who can demonstrate they have no other financial resources or employment. And that results in public welfare benefits um, being attached to a great deal of stigma. Uh, so it's it's viewed as, um, you know, there's something wrong with the people who receive benefits because they're not able to fall into uh, kind of the general um, philosophy of being independent. And we also um, tend to have unregulated labor markets. And so that adds to more class inequity. Um, on, on the contrast, uh, Finland and other Nordic countries, other European countries fall in the social democratic regime. Um, they tend to have more universal benefits to the whole population, um, as well as centralized wage setting to ensure more um, equity among classes. And um, policies support more egalitarian dual earner models. So there's more employment overall um, and tends to be less gender inequity. And it's a higher support context in general for, for all people, not just as a last resort. And we know that um, social policy context is a predictor of parents' well-being. So if you can click um, Mia. 
I'm going to talk more about this glass at all study later, but I think it's important to point out now that these broad cultural beliefs and approaches to supporting the population really translate into outcomes for families and individuals. So in this glass at all review, um, they examined well-being or happiness of parents versus non-parents. And in this study, the U.S. had the largest gap in happiness between parents and, and non-parents. So parents were significantly less happy than non-parents. Um, in Finland, by comparison, parents were happier than non-parents. So um, we really see a difference in well-being, and they link that um, to the policy context. So now we're going to explore some of the key differences in the U.S. and Finland social policies that uh, might help us understand this a little bit. Uh, really, I just have these here to give you a picture of economic insecurity in the United States. Um, both of these images are showing that the, there's a gap between the wealthiest um, and the poorest people in the United States, and it's growing. So since the 1970s, we've seen a real rise in upper income wealth and a decrease in middle income wealth um, and kind of stability in, in the lower income. Um, the second picture here or chart uh, shows that the percentage change in wealth is disproportionate. So upper income families um, have increased 69% in their um, wealth since 1970s, whereas um, lower income have only increased 45%. Um, next slide, please. So we have a significant portion of our population living with economic insecurity. Um, in the United States, we use a poverty line. In 2023, it's 30,000 US dollars for a family of four. Um, it's hard to talk about US dollars in a global context, but uh, cost of living is around 60,000 US dollars in the lowest cost areas of the United States. Um, in most of America, it's actually much higher. So $30,000 is, is very insufficient uh, to really live in the United States. And that means that poverty line um, is sort of insufficient in capturing economic insecurity in the US. And so we often actually talk about uh, this in terms of 200% of the poverty line. That's what we call low income families in the US. Um, and that's closer to the cost of living, again, in the lowest cost um, areas. And so we have approximately 37% of US children who are living in low income families and facing um, economic insecurity. And there's a lot of variation across the United States. Um, it's Again, we have one poverty line for this really giant country, um, but we see that there are higher rates, higher concentrations of poverty in the Southern United States. That's where these darker um, blotches are on the map. Um, and this is similar to other maps. I could show you maps about um, chronic illness or sexually transmitted infections or unintended pregnancy or other kind of risk factors. And you see the same pattern where they're concentrated more in the southern United States. Um, that's clearly related to um, politics and a lot of other factors. And so again, kind of intersectionality is important to consider because we see differences in um, lots of lots of areas of identity based on that um, lower United States. And rates of poverty are substantially higher among Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous families compared to white Americans. Um, there's a long history of racial oppression in the United States that continues to shape families' experiences. So um, we're not going to get into that a lot right now, but Dr. Sherry Smith will be here um, later in the presentation, and she's going to talk about her work with uh, Black African American families in the U.S. Okay. Can move forward, thanks. So the US has a set of policies um, aimed at improving the lives of families and as a whole, they reflect and promote individualism, self-sufficiency and um, and so I'm gonna just give you a quick overview and I'm gonna probably go really fast. So if you just wanna click through them, yeah. Um, FMLA is unpaid leave and it is a universal program, but only 56% of US employed persons even qualify for it. There's a lot of requirements around the type of employer that you have. And then we have a problem that very few people actually use FMLA um, when they, um, transition to parenthood because they can't afford to not have income um, and it's unpaid leave. We don't have any federal level paid leave, but some states have started to enact their own paid leave programs. Um, you can see on the map, there's a few states in the United States, um, but they have varying benefits and we still have a problem where the benefit they provide are not really sufficient. Um, there is just a small portion of 
um, salary. And so many families aren't able to um, utilize those. And then our health insurance is employment based for the most part. So um, you need to have an employer in order to receive health insurance. Um, and then otherwise, you have to meet a really low um, poverty threshold in order to get the state um, health insurance. And we do have pregnancy activated insurance. So when um, people become pregnant, they can get on the state insurance and they have it until 60 days postpartum. Um, unless a state decides to give it to them longer. Um, and, and so my area of research around the transition to parenthood and uh, maternal depression, um, that is really insufficient, 60 days. Um, most families need support for much longer than that postpartum. And then we have uh, the child tax credit, um, which is where U.S. families um, can get a re reduction to their tax bill um, when, when they file it once a year. Um, this is probably the most generous benefit in the United States, but it's really problematic because it benefits people who pay taxes, so they have to have income. Um, if you don't pay taxes, then you can get a portion of this credit refundable to you as a payment, uh, but it's not the full thing. And um, you have to file your taxes in order to even get that refundable payment. Um, and it's very complicated in the U.S. and often costs money, actually, to file um, your taxes. Yeah, if you could click forward a couple there. Um, and then we have some programs specifically for families in poverty. Um, these are all federal programs, but they're run through states. And so that means that they vary quite a lot depending on the state that you live in. Um, states determine the eligibility criteria, the benefit, et cetera. And so depending on where you live, you might receive different states and you might not qualify for all of them um, in certain states and then qualify for them in others. And most of them you have to separately apply for. So we have unemployment um, if you lose a job, but again, there's, there's strict eligibility criteria. So you have to have held the job for long enough um, and then it's a temporary uh, payment. We have housing assistance um, that pays partial housing. So the family always needs to pay part of the housing. Um, and there's a long wait list to get on what we call section eight housing. Um, women, infants and children supports pregnant women and children under five and provides vouchers for certain foods like baby food, formula, uh, milk. And then SNAP is um, a supplemental nutrition assistance program. So it provides um, vouchers for groceries. Um, but again, it is very restricted. So there's only certain groceries that you're allowed to buy um, with SNAP. And then Medicaid is the health insurance for people in poverty, um, but you have to be in quite a low level of poverty to receive this. And so many low-income families don't qualify um, for, for a lot of these services. And then finally, TANF is temporary assistance for needy families. It's a cash payment that families receive. Um, and I'm gonna discuss that a little bit more in the, in the next couple of slides. So um, we had a major welfare reform in the United States in 1996. And I mean, you can move to the next slide. Um, the, the goal of it was to try to reduce uh, people's dependence on welfare programs and for them to be used more as temporary supports to move people out of poverty. Um, the data do not support that that has been successful in moving people out of poverty. We don't see much um, mobility in terms of economics. Um, in the United States, but the changes have resulted in a reduction in the number of families who receive benefits. So you can see here in 1996, for every 100 families with children living in poverty, um, 68 received some cash payment, um, the TANF. By 2020, um, it provided cash assistance to only 21 families um, of every 100 in poverty. And um, on the next slide, you can see that for those who receive TANF, so it's still a, a small portion of people, but the value of the cash payment that they receive has declined over time. Uh, the payments really haven't kept pace with inflation. So um, there's even some states in red here who have cut benefits or have not increased them since 1996. Um, since 1996, we've experienced significant inflation in the United States. And so um, those payments have actually uh, become less for families provided less benefit. And then on the next slide, um, I just wanted to point out that there's a ton of variation in families' experiences based on where they live. So this is one example. Um, I live in Washington and I used to live in Florida, so I'm picking on those two states. Um, but this is a family, a two-parent family with one child. And in each case, there's a requirement that parents meet a low-income requirement that's set by the state. And then that they're either working or involved in work or training. 
Um, and you can see that to qualify for TANF, you have to have fewer resources in Florida. That's like savings account, um, things that you own like a car or a house. So you have to have very little. And then there are lifetime limits on receipt of TANF. So um, those differ by state. And then the actual amount that you receive differs by state. And there is a difference in the cost of living in these two states, but it's um, very small. It does not account for this difference in receipt of benefits. All right, so um, on the next slide, I just wanted to share quickly, and then I will pass this over to Mia, um, yeah, that in the US, the social safety net is, is just insufficient. So when families face unexpected stressors, um, they can quickly end up in a place of economic insecurity and their intersectional identities and experiences really shape their ability to seek out support from friends and family, navigate towards programs. Um, and a lot of times they have to rely on sporadic or unpredictable support from churches or food banks, friends and families, et cetera. So um, I have two quotes. Um, these are just examples from interviews with parents who gave birth during the pandemic. So we weren't asking about uh, finances or anything like that or social support. Um, but in this example, this person talked about how a loss of a job meant that they had to move in with with their family. They didn't, they couldn't afford their own place anymore. Um, and in this situation, the family, at least they had a family so that um, they had some place that they could go, but that there was a lot of stress around that financial loss. And then um, on the next slide, this family really talks about um, how their plans were disrupted by a temporary layoff. Um, and really they couldn't even afford supplies for their baby. Um, so again, that was a huge stressor. And in this example, this family had advantage in terms of friends and family networks. So they were able to purchase baby supplies for them. Um, but many families don't have that, that kind of informal safety net um, that allows them to get through these stressful moments. Okay, Mia. Good. I just found my mic. Uh, it was disappearing as well as the camera. Uh, thanks so much, Amy. Um, okay, I continue if my slide starts moving again. Um, there. Yeah. A few words about Finland. So the case with Finland is, is, um, is quite different, but we have discussed it a lot with Amy that we do have some similarities as well, and I will also present some of the um, perhaps a little bit su surprising similarities as well um, in the end of my presentation. So uh, in Finland, the um, social policy is really the universal social policy and the development of the process has been a very long um, and a complex process. So um, that has created, in fact, a, a sort of a complex system of, of, of the uh, social policy. Uh, and the support for families. Um, so it is part of the Nordic welfare state or social democratic welfare state regime. So basically it has universalist, universalistic and um, kind of very uh, wide approach to welfare. It has, um, it has been uh, very much supported by the, uh, by the people living in Finland. So there is a general support for the model. Uh, this has been uh, resulted in low levels of poverty or people living in pov poverty, uh, but yet there is inequality and disadvantage, um, and recently that has been um, increasing. Um, and really recently, the social policies and welfare service systems have been kind of um, being discussed through neoliberalism, austerity, activation policies, and increased private responsibility. So it's really that the I would say that the Finnish case is changing. Um, and also uh, we do have regional differences. So in the um, in the map here um, is sort of a, a regional disadvantage. This is an index based on various indicators, and you see that the darker areas they um, there are certain areas in Finland that where people kind of uh, experience more uh, disadvantage compared to some other areas. Um, okay, just to show you that um, that there are differences, even we tend to talk that it's a kind of a universalistic country. Um, then a few words about child poverty. Um, in here is a, a, 
an image, a figure of um, low-income um, families. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the proportion of children living in low-income families. And um, I'm sorry, there's some Finnish there, I realize now, <laughs> the image. Um, there are uh, kind of three different thresholds. So the darkest one is those earning 40% of the uh, annual median income. And then the lightest um, is 50 to 60%. That is usually um, considered as the low income threshold. Um, so you see that there has been an increase in children living in low income families. And um, it is interest interesting that actually um, the it has been increasing also in times of economic um, growth. Uh, but at the same time, there has been kind of um, renewals in the social policy, for example, on position of uh, lone parent families that have kind of decreased the situation for those, for those families. So in Finland, uh, in 2020, around 11% uh, of children uh, live in low-income families. Um, and what is also uh, important to know that almost a tenth of all families with children received social assistance. So that's a benefit of last resource in, in Finland. And um, if you then also consider those families receiving social assistance uh, for longer than two years, like, like two or three years, it's um, around uh, 3% percent of all families receive that. And I think for a country like Finland, that's actually quite a high figure. Okay, so in Finland, um, the poverty of families with children and child poverty concentrates on low parent families, families with many children, and families coming from migrant backgrounds. And for example, our labor markets are rather, um, that it's quite difficult it might be a bit difficult to to be employed um, with a migrant background, and there's a huge regional dispar disparities in this. Okay, um, here the figure is not. I'm sorry that I'm trying to change the camera. If I don't know if you see it like I do, so it was in on top of the of the figure. Um, but here in the in the figure, I wanted to show this is a um, from a publication of Pratcho and Nivenhus. Um And they, what they are showing, um, and I included, even though the, the image is not, um, it didn't come out so nicely for this slide, but I still took it because I, did, I think it's really um, important, interesting to show that before the kind of social transfers, the poverty risk in Finland, that is the light gray pillar, um, it is actually quite high. But then after the transfers, so Finland has the capacity to reduce the uh, poverty risk. And this is the uh, poverty risk for under for under those aged 18. So I would say that Finland has had a successful policy. Um, lately, it's a bit concerning that now it seems like uh, we want to get rid of some of the good policies that we have had. So, um, but because we've we've had some very good practices. Okay, let me just see if I could get my slides moving again. There we go. Um, here is an image of showing the kind of types of, of fam the way that families are supported. So basically there are three uh, pillars. There's benefits, services, and then leaves. Um, and here is a list. I'm not going to go through all this. I just wanted to show that there's a huge amount of different kinds of uh, benefits, um, that they are kind of located at different levels, uh, the societal level, municipal or regional level or local levels. Um, and then we have a sort of extensive parental leaves as well as services. Um, also, I, I placed the certain local level um, services in there such as um, NGOs working with families and and, and charity food aids um, and uh, there's also a lot of kind of temporary projects providing socio-economic uh, support 
And this is something I don't think that we often consider in Finland, that actually some of the supports that families can receive uh, can be a bit, um, how do you say that, um, it might vary a lot depending where you live and what kind of projects there is, is, there is running. Okay, and I go to new there. Um, I took a few quotes as well, uh, just to highlight that in regardless of the universalist universality, uh, receiving the social assistance uh, might still be very complex. I mean, you might be kind of bouncing between different systems. In this quote, this um, uh, this is the, from a, a colleague's uh, publication. There, the the um, informant is saying that you first have to apply, even though you know uh, you can't get it from the kind of a state level, and then you come back and you apply again, and and now she's saying that she has to do it again for the third time, and it's really kind of this inc encouraging that you have to do it um, again and again, even though you would know that you have to do it so many times that you could you can't just go straight to the right um, office basically and then um, it is still very kind of humiliating or stigmatizing to give to be receiving basic social assistance um, for example there is one who said that she experienced um, charity food aid as a salvation so she would rather go to the uh, food lines to get to get food than to get the basic social assistance. Um, and then another interview who said that the in receiving income benefit uh, was very shocking and it was very humili humiliating experience that she doesn't want to be uh, applying for for the aid anymore. So I think. There we are sharing some similarities, even though that we have this sort of universal system with the US. Okay, here you go, Amy. Thanks, Mia. So um, just to wrap this up so we can move forward, um, the ways that Finland and the US approach supporting families in poverty um, are different and they shape families' experiences. Um, I wanted to come back to this glass at all systematic review. Uh, they found that the largest impact of public policies on parents' well-being came from a comprehensive policy package, which included paid parenting leave, work flexibility, and paid sick and vacation leave. And in those countries with the strongest policy packages, such as the Nordic countries and Finland, uh, the parental deficit in happiness was completely eliminated. So parents um, were actually happier than non-parents, as opposed to countries like the United States, where we see the opposite. Um, and individual aspects that are the most impactful tend to be sick and vacation leave and subsidized public sector child care. And then another interesting um, paper translated policy impact to the child level um, through this through a life course lens. And it really highlighted the types and timing of family policies and the rate of return in terms of children's developmental outcomes. Um, and you can see from this chart that prenatal and postpartum supports, of course, have the highest rate of return on children's um, developmental outcomes. All right, so um, in terms of our conclusions, uh, we find it useful to think about um, economic insecurity through an ecological framework um, and thinking about the, the ways in which um, various systems work together and impact the lives of families. And really in our future work, we wanna think beyond the country level um, I think we were maybe both surprised that there's so much variability, um, even in Finland and a, a smaller country, but certainly in the United States, um, that supports for families really vary based on where families live um, and their kind of intersectional identities. And um, we also need to think about the chrono system that policy supports and benefits vary across time. Um, of course, in the long term, as historical events unfold and social change happens and leadership changes, but even uh, more frequently at the local level, uh, because in both of our countries, families rely a lot on sporadic and one-time supports that may be available one week, but not available the next. And um, another similarity is that culturally, um, you know, living in poverty is associated with shame and experiences of disrespect in both of our countries. Um, and 
that social impact of poverty is really important because it may prohibit capabilities or serve as a barrier to families navigating towards resources. Um, and so our goal is really to engage in more qualitative work um, to understand the experiences of economically disadvantaged families and also understand children's experiences. And then finally, um, as Mia said earlier, I think uh, just remembering that vulnerability is produced and it's often the result of structural background. And that means it can be changed and tackled. Um, and when we're thinking about vulnerability, we have to think about intersectionality and uh, not all families who are economically disadvantaged are the same. Some face additional intersectional identities that make it more challenging to access supports. Others face advantages or have informal um, friends and family networks that can support them in times of stress. All right, thank you. That's the end of um, our presentation. And next, we're gonna move to our esteemed colleagues' presentations. Uh, first up, we have Professor Amita Yaga from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And she's gonna share her presentation with us, uh, Motherhood, a Silent Pandemic, Amplifying the Voices of Low-Income Women in South Africa. Thank you, Amita. Okay, um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so hello everyone and, and me and Amy, thank you so much for the invite. Um, so this is a pilot project um, and it's sort of deep into the qualitative uh, participatory action um, research work. And uh, it was a collaborative piece between um, uh, two non-academic stakeholders, which was a women's rights group um, called Flourish. Um, and they uh, their focus is on eradicating stunting. Um, and the Western Cape government, which is our provincial government, um, as our two non-academic partners. And then we worked across um, three academic institutions um, across different faculties. Um, and so I just to give you some sort of visual imagery, this is an informal settlement. This picture is an of, of informal settlement called Red Hill. It's literally on a hill, so it's very rocky um, with a bit of forest. It's very difficult to access um, transport, schools, um, health services, um, and and so it just I just wanted to paint a little bit of a picture. And so that is a community. Um, a toilet facility uh, with for the shacks around to um, to make use of. So um, some of our mums came from this particular informal settlement. Um, so the the problem that we responded to was we had seen with uh, the NIDS crime data, and so the NIDS crime data was sort of um, quantitative data during coronavirus. Um, it, it's the National Income Dynamic Survey, which was hap which had like about five or seven waves of um, panel data prior to, to COVID. And then when COVID hit, um, they added the CRAM part, which was the Coronavirus Rapid Mobility Survey. And so um, there's this sort of large data sets that are publicly accessible. Um, but what the data showed us at a, at a quantitative level was that um, of the 3 million jobs in South Africa, that were lost in COVID, 2 million were women. Um, and uh, in South Africa, about 42% of households are women-headed households, um, single moms. Um, and and th th those in low-income sort of economic situations were um, most vulnerable. Uh, so in these homes uh, they, where they had like, lost their jobs and also where... Um, there were single-headed households, food insecurity was increasing at a rapid rate. And the NIDS crime data showed us that in, in those households, mums were shielding and they were four times more likely to, to experience depression. And so sort of that at a um, more like quantitative overview gave us something to be very curious about to try and understand, well, what was the lived reality? And, and, 
policy responses tended to be siloed. Um, and we knew that these were very intersecting vulnerabilities that were particularly hitting low income um, and black mothers, particularly um, the, the hardest. So we want to do, pay sufficient attention um, to really focus their lived realities. Um, but also we felt that we wanted them to, to really express to us how these vulnerabilities intersected with each other and where they would have identified the best points of intervention and what those intervention points would have been. And so we embarked on a, a photo voice study um, to, to do exactly that and to identify these points of intervention at structural, relational and individual levels um, and to use it to inform transformative um, and innovative policy solutions. So as I mentioned, we wanted to use a feminist decolonial methodology, um, which we, we chose photo voice and we co-designed the, the project and with, with Flourish and Western Cape government. Um, so we applied for, they were involved in actually writing the grant with us. Um, and when we got the grant, we then through Flourish accessed 12 low income mothers as, as co-researchers. And we started working with them from our first workshop with them was in April this year. And our last, we've just been, the photo voice exhibition was finished yesterday. Um, so we spent the first sort of two full days with them thinking through um, what it means to be a mother, how they experience sort of motherhood, uh, what were the vulnerabilities they were exposed to, using quite a bit of um, arts-based methodologies um, to try and get them exercising sort of using visual method, you know, visual objects to tell stories. Um, they then sort of were trained in taking photos and what we were looking for, they were trained in consent. And then we we went away and they came back and then showed us what we were looking for in terms of what are their strengths, what are their needs, what are their struggles, um, and then also how they saw themselves as experts uh, of their motherhood and of their lived realities. And so the next set of workshops were then around unpacking those, uh, both at an individual level and then and collectively. Um, so they, they told these stories, they then did the analysis um, and the interpretation and then came up with um, a call to action. Uh, and then we went again, went away again for some time and came back together to say, okay, now with this call to action and now with that better understanding of sort of these intersections um, and, and points of intervention, uh, what, what would you want to do? And one of the things were a, an exhibition to engage directly with various stakeholders. Um, and so we co-developed co what that exhibition would look like, um, what was the sort of aim and purpose of it, who would be the, the sort of audiences. And so we came up with uh, three, three particular exhibitions. The one was where they actually were able to um, invite their community members and their family. Um, the second one was a public exhibition, which was just open to general public. And then the third one, which we finished with yesterday, was uh, engage, the mothers engaging directly with government, with funders, with NGOs, and with academics. And then throughout the process between um, sort of March and, and November, which our last debrief is tomorrow, we had uh, quarterly debriefs with the research team, um, which included our non-academic stakeholders. And so what was able to be done was that government, um, our government partner and our uh, women's rights partner were able to sort of make improvements to their own work and insert the um, the findings through in back and push it back into their work to to improve what they were doing as as sort of the findings were were unfolding. Um, so just a sort of few demographics around the, the mothers, they range, ages range between sort of 21 and, and 37, but some had their first pregnancy at age 14. Um, some were in work, some weren't in work, um, in paid work. Um, they had different numbers of children at different ages. The mums with children two years and under were allowed to bring their 
um, babies to uh, the workshops. And we then also provided child minders. We also paid them a, a daily living wage um, and their transport for each day that, that they worked with us to ensure that the process didn't leave them worse off just by participating in, in the research. Um, and so, like I said, initially, we spent quite a bit of time to build trust and to build that sort of reflexive muscle for them to be able to use different objects. We got them to, sorry, this is a bit blurry. Um, we got them to, to start by also drawing uh, what we called a river of my motherhood journey. There's an example of the mums doing it um, and the way they used like dried beans as the rocky moments and difficult moments in their lives um, and sort of colorful sprinkles as the brighter moments. And so some of the themes when they narrated these rivers, these river journeys um, was around quite a, quite a lot of obstetric violence, um, miscarriages from obstetric violence, um, uh, a lot of hustling that they had to do just to get by, um, just the, the the challenges that arise from patriarchy, um, but there were also joys. So there was a lot of self growth. They felt, um, you know, really confident. Their confidence increased as a mum. Postnatal pregnant uh, depression came up quite a bit. Teenage pregnancies, um, a lack of empathy in the health system. So they felt that because they were of low income status, they just weren't given. They weren't treated with any dignity in the healthcare system. Um, also, just in terms of uh, you know, the, there wasn't any support. So there was a lot of um, judgment around them becoming teenage mums from their own communities, a lot of abandonment from um, uh, fathers where there was like denial of, of being the father and just complete abandonment. Um, yeah, and just, just uh, you know, a huge amount of, of challenges and difficulties, um, but also the joys of being mums. So I think, you know, it was important to get them to bring out both sides of their stories. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we, the, the, in terms of the photographs, we'd ask them to take photos of their strengths, their needs, their struggles. Um, and then we had them analyze each of them and build on that collectively and then to map how they intersect. Um, and so we, we use that as the sort of process of how the, what unfolded in terms of the research. So just here's a few examples of uh, the strengths that were in the workshop itself, not yet in the exhibition, um, but just like around perseverance, uh, around seeing their growth, often depicted by plants, um, faith, their faith came in um, breastfeeding, being able to sort of be a strength where they could provide comfort um, and be close to their child. Um, and so in, in here, they felt that their motherhood gave them um, strengths. But at the end of the work, at, you know, at the end of the process, I think on reflection, what they said is that many of these strengths um, come about because of their struggles. So they're born from their struggles. And so they wouldn't actually have wanted many of these strengths. So the per perseverance and somebody took a photo of their cesarean section um, where they'd experienced obstetric violence, but they've come through it. They felt like they shouldn't have had to have that strength and they're tired of having to be strong, um, often strong single moms uh, without enough resources and support. Um, so, and then this was sort of more the exhibition um, in terms of their struggles. Uh, they felt that often parenting programs said that you have to be patient, be attentive, be committed. And they just felt that it was additional pressures put on moms um, in very low income sort of spaces where there weren't resources. Often their areas around were unsafe. So either from um, they were in often in, living in gang infested areas or where um, the, the lack of safety came from um poor sanitation so there were holes that you know the the children could fall into um just also what we then titled the mother load because it was this constant preoccupation with just getting by in a very dangerous environment with very few resources with very little support doing a lot of invisible care work um 
and and there were yeah so there was a level of sort of cognitive labor exhaustion emotional labor um very high unemployment in South Africa and so it was very difficult to get jobs but layered with that for example in the communities um there was a lot of uh corruption or nepotism community chiefs often were gatekeepers to access information so if somebody knew for example of a job that was available they would tell somebody oh you need to pay me a thousand rand if you want to have the information of the job and the one mom said well can I first see if I get the job and then I'll pay you the money for just giving me the information and they were like no um and also just a lot of everyone's become loan shocks. So your neighbor would be a loan shock. Your family members would be loan shocks. If you borrow like a hundred grand, you would be expected to pay it back at um, 150% interest. So those were a lot of the struggles. Access to food, um, access to safe environments were, were very, very high. And then these were the needs. So just a need to for the constant supply and a consistent supply of um, nappies and and food and medication for children accessing medication um, was very difficult because in the in, particularly in the Red Hill area which I showed you um, there's a mobile clinic which comes only once a week moms have to actually walk through a very dangerous forest to get to the mobile clinic which is quite ironic because it's mobile but it can't nobody wants to listen to them to move it closer um, but when they that then will ask a male to accompany them for the day, which they have to pay um, so that they are protected when they walk through the forest, they would get to the mobile clinic and they'll either be told they're out of vaccines or they're out of the medication. So you would need to go to a pharmacy. And so there's a, a further cost on getting transport to a, a pharmacy where they actually wouldn't even have the money to purchase um, the medication, food insecurity was, yeah, uh, so sort of access to food, healthy food was a huge need and, and the need for safety, for homes to be safe inside. There isn't enough space often. So for example, there's no surface space. So kettles would be on the floor and that was dangerous for children who were crawling. Um, but then also you'll see, for example, just safety outside of schools to protect the schools. But once the children exit the school, there isn't the safety. So they could be caught in a crossfire. Um, uh, a mom couldn't let her children play outside because again, uh, they either might, you know, they, they would either be caught in gang violence or in other sort of sexual assault or, or, or um, other sort of sort of unsafe um, uh, con yeah, some sort of consequences for of the unsafe environment. Um, so we collectively, the mums collectively unpacked what those were. Um, we then engaged in putting those together and mapping them out. So the mothers made the connections between their strengths, their struggles. And so they mapped them all out um, with sort of verbalizing those particular connections, um, which gave, produced this very complex sort of web of how their strengths, their struggles, their needs are multi-layered, multifaceted um, and, and interconnected. And then we asked them sort of to also think through, well, what do they have control over, which is in the center, what would they who would they need to be in relation with um to to address their needs and strengths and struggles in this in this sort of circle that was around their 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 control and then what institutions did they need support from and then that um led to i'm going to skip this one for now, that led to them coming up with a call to action which was um they identified three key key needs, which was a need for safe housing, um, just to to allow them a little bit more sort of um, peace and calm in their mothering process around um, being able to access adequate sanitation, um, being able to have uh, recreational spaces that were safe, um, quicker responses from emergencies, because if uh, houses caught a light because of uh, paraffin lamps, for example, nobody responded. Um, if people were giving birth and going into labor, medical emergencies weren't responding. Um, if there were gang, if there was gang shooting, 
the police weren't responding. And so they needed quicker responses to make their environments safer. Um, they needed schools to be closer to their homes, for example, because children were walking um, long distances on highways on their own um, from the age of two years old and five years old. Um, and so that all added. And so the one mom said, for example, like every day when they come back home, like I pray to God and thank God that that they are safe and then I can breathe. Um, so, and then in terms of financial security, just around accessing jobs was really hard for them. Um, there, there is a expanded public works program, which is supposed to offer employment, but the mom said to us that once they pay for childcare and once they pay for their transport cost, um, what they earn is less than those costs. So actually they would be in debt if they took up the job. Um, Need, yeah, so the need for, for better health care and um, health, yeah, care that wasn't so expensive for them so that they could be economically active um, and skills development so that they could, for example, um, be able to earn while also perhaps either working from home or um, other sort of flexibility in the way jobs are designed to factor in and center care, care work. And the third one was around... Um, the need to end male domination. So, you know, for example, like there, there are a number of family strengthening programs, but they don't recognize the disproportionate care work that mothers do. Um, just making more visible the invisible mother load, which is what we called it. Um, and and encourage you know, more education for men around care work um, and what they could do, uh, government actions around gender equality, shifting gendered norms, um, and then also in spaces like works and uh, workplaces and in schools uh, where leadership is far more aware of, of the gender, um, to sort of to actively promote gender equality. And um, and so this culminated in our exhibition, um, which we had over the, the last uh, three days um, with, with the moms. So I just, I missed one um, because the sequencing, I think, wasn't 100% right. But we also wanted the moms to recognize themselves as experts. And so we also got them to take photographs of their expertise as mothers. And these were really, really rich. And I think very moving also to just see the ability to, um, so, so the process for this project was also really important. And so one mum said to us that um, when she, you know, before coming on to this research project, um, when she couldn't feed her child for two days and there was no food in the house at all, she felt that she didn't deserve to be a mother. And having now been part of this research, um, she feels if, if there's no food in the house for two days, she can, um, she is still a good mother because she's trying her best to, to find money and to find food to feed her child. And so they converted these, um, they sort of translated these, these visual images also in, into poems um, that they wrote up that was part of the exhibition. Um, so just, yeah, reflections and next steps. So this work takes a lot of time. It is uh, almost nine months of work, but, but but a year and a half if we think about the starting the, to write the research grant. And it was a pilot only. Um, and it it was really important to build trusting relationships with these mums. Um, so, so, yeah, that was a, a reflection for them to be able to open up in the ways that they did. Initially, they wanted to stage their photographs and we could see that the photographs were like of really good plates of food and very well-dressed children um, because poverty is so stigmatized um, and it took one mom to show a very sort of raw and natural photo that then allowed them to to go to to really be honest with us um, and and so that that reflection around the, the stigma of poverty and the hyper surveillance in their own communities around the one mom said that we can't actually um, we can't say we're borrowing money for food because you'll be shamed if and the whole community will talk about it if you cannot, if you don't have enough money for food. So they lie and they say, oh, I don't have electricity. Can I, can I please borrow money for electricity? Um, yeah, and I think including the partners from the, the non-academic partners from the get-go was really helpful because there was buy-in. And so throughout the process, changes were being made on the ground. Um, I think it was important to recognize the several complexities also in their lives, but then also in logistics. 
Um, so we often were faced with certain logistics um, that 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 we had to quickly adapt to because of transport issues with the mums or them not having data, which we didn't know, but then we topped up their data. Um, so so that was yeah something that that I learned quite a bit from. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I think really centered that the moms always felt recognized, valued and heard as experts. And so I think it was important that our last, um, a work, a, a, our last exhibition that, that actually government acknowledged them as experts and, and how valuable this knowledge was to them. Um, I think my dog is telling me it's time to stop. So this is my last slide. Um, the scale, yeah, next steps is we, we've we applied for scaling funding to scale the project to low-income fathers to understand their needs around care um, and, and how they see mother's care work and how they make sense of the mother load. Um, yeah, the, the, the findings have started to, to make government think around um, their focus on a care economy um, and the the sort of the women's rights movement has started to make changes on their model um and then we're trying to get to insert these uh the evidence-based findings on government agendas to to get it more to get the invisible care work of mothers um recognized that's me <laughs> thank you so much amita that was um really incredible powerful study and uh it's a it's amazing the use of arts and images and including mothers as co-researchers. It's, it's really inspiring. I thank you for um, sharing that with us. Thank so you. That's, yeah, next we um, have the honor of hearing from Dr. Sharday Smith, who's an associate professor at the University of Illinois um, Urbana-Champaign in the United States. And she's gonna share uh, some about her research on African-American parents' strategies to manage and resist racism-related stressors. So take it away, Sharde. thank you. Thank you. Let me try to make sure I can share my screen okay. And can you hear me okay? We can hear you. I don't see your screen yet, but. And now I see it, perfect. Okay, let me make sure. All right, well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, thank you, Amy and Mia, for the opportunity uh, to present on uh, African-American parent strategies to manage and resist racism-related stressors. Uh, as Amy had said, I'm Sharde McNeil-Smith. I'm an associate professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So today what I'll plan on doing is to um, briefly describe the U.S. racial landscape and how it contributes to various outcomes uh, at the individual, family, and community levels. Uh, I will then describe research on how uh, Black parents can promote healing from racism-related stressors. Uh, I admit I'm not going into the weeds, but doing more global um, analysis and um, uh, descriptions of these manifestations. So I'll just be talking about uh, general findings. And then finally, I'll try to re uh, introduce a reframing of resilience to really think about resistance um, and uh, just the shift into understanding the, the need um, and interrogating the need for resilience and the problems with that. And so we are looking to meet these objectives by centering the conversations around experiences of African-American or Black American communities, um, the historical trauma that Black American communities have experienced shapes the current manifestation of racial trauma in contemporary Black communities. And so although there are some similar processes at play for other marginalized groups, there are also unique experiences uh, for Black Americans that I will give voice to. So first, I think it's important to define race and racism um, as they are reinforcing constructs and as they are um, situated within the U.S. context. And so race is a social construction that was created to justify and maintain racial oppression, domination, and exclusion. In the U.S., it is based on the notion, um, and across, you know, in other societies as well, but in the, uh, on the notion that humans can be divided into distinct groups 
based on physical characteristics such as phenotype, skin color, and hair texture. Uh, currently, based on the U.S. Uh, census, there are five racial categories, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asia, Asian, Black, or African American, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, and white. Uh, these categories have and continue to shift over time, which further demonstrates their social construction. But nonetheless, these uh, racial categories have real consequences for individuals, families, and communities. Racism now is a system that reinforces the notion that socially constructed um, racial differences create superior, superiority and inferiority of specific racial categories. It includes structures, policies, practices, and norms that unfairly disadvantages some individuals. Um, and then by consequence, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. And then there's different types of racism that I'll briefly outline. And so there's different typologies um, or scholars have used different typologies to really characterize um, racism. And I'll just use one, but there's other ways of thinking about it. Uh, but we can think about it as uh, structural, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized racism. Structural racism are those longstanding racialized practices in our social and economic structures, um, which can include education, health, housing, and criminal justice systems. These uh, or such structural racism has created mass incarceration, our existing health disparities, which I'll describe um, soon, and segregated and impoverished communities. We have institutional racism, which um, is structured in our social and economic institutions, uh, including organizations, businesses, schools, police departments, and other systems that deliberately and indirectly discriminate against certain groups of people. So it's through those policies and practices within the institutions that uh, this racism exhibits itself, which can limit rights and opportunities. And then we have interpersonal racism, which are the prejudices and discriminatory behavior, where one group makes assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of other groups. Uh, this interpersonal racism can be direct or indirect, subtle or overt. And usually when we're talking about racism, this is the, the level or the, uh, the type that most people think about that come to mind, kind of those direct interpersonal interactions. But as we are, um, uh, seeing that racism can, is multifaceted, multidimensional, and can exhibit itself in multiple ways. And then internalized racism, which is actually being um, reframed uh, to appropriated racialized oppression, um, is when members of stigmatized groups uh, who are bombarded with those negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic works tend to internalize those negative mes messages um, or appropriate in other words, those negative messages and um, engage in different behaviors that signify that they believe those negative, um, uh, uh, those negative frames or negative stories about their racial group. And so, um, although racism infiltrates, you know, all facets of our society uh, and is deeply ingrained in uh, the American society we see that it contributes to racial disparities that are especially consequential for Black Americans. Uh, for education, uh, for example, Black American students have disproportionately lower quality education and graduation rates and face disparities in college enrollment and completion rates compared to their white counterparts. With employment, we see that Black American individuals have historically experienced higher unemployment rates compared to white individuals. There are also wage gaps between black and white workers with black individuals earning on average less than their white counterparts for similar work. We see within healthcare that the uh, disparities exist in black Americans access to healthcare services, insurance coverage, and limited access to quality healthcare facilities. There are also disparities in health outcomes, including higher rates of certain chronic diseases and shorter life expectancy for Black Americans, 
in fact, Black males have the lowest life expectancy in the U.S. We saw these disparities um, really come to life, these health uh, care and health disparities really come to life during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Criminal justice disparities also exist. Um, Black American individuals are disproportionately represented in arrest and incarceration rates. Um, and this is reflected in our country's mass incarceration. Black Americans also face harsher sentences compared to white individuals for similar offenses. Police violence disproportionately affects Black individuals, leading to movements that are advocating for police reform and racial justice. And we really saw this come to a head in 2020 with the uh, killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Uh, there's disparities in wealth. There's a significant wealth gap between Black and white in households, with Black American households generally having lower median wealth. We also see um, sorry, disparities in um, home ownership rates with a lower percentage of Black families owning homes compared to white families. And these are rooted in structural policies such as redlining and exclusion from the GI Bill post-World War II. And then finally, we see some disparities in voting rights where there's continued efforts to restrict voting rights, which disproportionately affect Black American community. And these efforts can include restrictive voter ID laws and gerrymandering. So as a result, we see that this multifaceted, multidimensional um, ways that racism infiltrates um, the American uh, society and it disproportionately affects Black Americans can lead to racial trauma and manifestations of trauma-related symptoms at the individual, family, and community level. Individually, we see that um, there's emotional, physiological, psychological, physical, and behavioral symptoms um, that can happen, particularly between uh, among interpersonal racism, but also um, through the um, uh, some of the systems that are leading to the racial disparities that I just outlined before. But in the family system, we see that there might be increases in isolation or withdrawal. Um, a lot of my work is showing that it, we see disruptions in relationships. It has impacts on parenting and overall functioning, as well as intergenerational transmission um, of this trauma. And then at the community level, we might see higher rates, of, or we do see higher rates of violence and disorder, structural disadvantage in the uh, form of concentrated poverty or residential instability, as well as diminished social capital and diminished uh, collective efficacy. And so given that we live in a racialized society that's ingrained with the systemic oppression, Black youth um, are having to grow up and navigate this reality. In fact, we see that Black youth um, from recent uh, research by English and others um, experienced about five incidents of racial discrimination per day in person and online. So Black American parents are then tasked with transmitting messages about race and racism to their children to help them navigate their society now and in the future. And this process of transmitting messages is called racial ethnic socialization. And we know through the literature um, that there are different types of messages that parents transmit to their children. One is racial pride, which fosters racial identity and development, which could include things like teaching the importance of Black history and um, really um, providing some examples to make sure that they understand who they are. The other is racial barrier messages, and these uh, tell their children that they have to um, or it prepares Black youth for racial bias, which includes telling children that they have to work twice as hard to achieve their goals as an example, or just letting them know that you will not be treated the same if you were to go into certain spaces, or you have to behave in a certain way to ensure your, uh, your safety. There are also self-worth messages that parents tell their children, um, which can bolster their positive self-view telling children to be proud of who they are, to love their hair, to love who they are as um, individuals, despite what the outside world might say. 
Then there might be egalitarian messages that are um, transmitted, which tell children that, you know, um, that we need people of different races to understand each other, that we need to um, really make sure that we love each other. And this can instill interracial equality and coexistence. I will say some of the work with the egalitarian is mixed because in one hand it does provide um, it does provide some uh, positive and resilience promoting capabilities, but we just make want to make sure that it does not promote a colorblind ideology because colorblind ideology actually has negative outcomes, which is essentially saying that we don't see color. And then um, some for um, protective um, as a protective approach, provide some negative messages, which centers those negative stereotypical attributes. And this has not been shown to be resilience promoting, but these um, can include like coaching children to um, what we call code switch or uh, act more white for the comfort of others as, um, so that you can fit in. And that has not been shown to be helpful. And so um, a lot of my work has really centered on understanding the precursors and correlates to this racial ethnic socialization practice and understanding how um, these processes are transmitted, not in the, vac in the vacuum. And so my research has shown that uh, racial ethnic socialization is better delivered and received in a supportive environment, a uh, supportive family environment. Uh, when those environments are not supportive, then that message may not be received. And so sometimes we may want to um, make sure that uh, children are in a supportive environment or they have, if it's not in the family environment, maybe there might be others who are transmitting these messages that can be resilience promoting. We must also consider parents' own racialized experiences um, because that has been shown to shape their parenting. Um, so, for example, some of my research has shown that parents' own um, experiences with discrimination affects the types of messages and the frequency of messages that they deliver to their children. And we know that racial ethnic socialization is a bi-directional process. And so um, the youth's uh, experiences with discrimination, as well as their own social identities, also shape how parents uh, transmit those messages. Uh, relatedly, we know that it's a gendered process such that parents transmit more racial pride messages to girls. So say, telling girls to be more prideful in who they are and to love themselves. However, given the, um, the, the racial violence that um, happens uh, for boys, we see that parents tend to uh, give more racial barrier messages to boys. There's a uh, dodge that uh, parents um, really like uh, um, parent the girls that love, uh, love their boys to make sure because they don't know when they may see them again. So furthermore, we know that youth skin tone may also facilitate different types of messages such that uh, darker skinned uh, children receive more racial barrier messages than lighter skinned children. And so in essence, we have to think about the intersection of other social identities and how that actually shapes parents and racial ethnic socialization processes and the need for those processes as they're navigating um, the world. And so what um, a colleague of mine have done is really put together some best practices. And I'm just gonna briefly talk about them on the need um, to talk to kids about racism. And it's not just Black kids, but all kids, because all kids are living in this racialized society. And so um, we know that it's important to talk about kids, uh, talk to kids about racism, because children as young as three can recognize and develop racial attitudes and biases. Um, and so acknowledging race and racism in a developmentally appropriate manner really helps children better understand racism and reduce bias, as opposed to saying that we don't see color um, and uh, to just, you know, ignore race, because eventually they are going to encounter it. And when they encounter it, you would want them to be prepared. 
So research again um, shows that silencing conversations about race or taking a race neutral approach can actually create more harm than good. And so when parents and caregivers don't create space for these conversations, then children don't know how to do it for themselves. So how can parents make space for race? Um, with young children, they could provide books and art with appropriate cultural representation. Um, I, I put a few of our, my kids' favorite books on here so that um, you know they grow up and they know that they should love themselves or just need just diverse representation. Um, also, there's just to share positive racial messages and engage children in culturally diverse activities will also be important um, at this age. With older children, um, it's important to begin to have that dialogue about the meaning of race in society and teach children about social justice. Uh, pointing out racial stereotypes and biases that might happen in movies and television or other art form, which is a form of racism, cultural racism that um, I didn't talk about before, but also exists. When racist injustices are in the news, um, initiate a conversation by asking, how are you feeling about what's happening right now? Don't ignore it. Don't try to pretend like they don't see it because they do. And it would be important for you to engage in that conversation with them. And when doing so, go at a child's uh, pace, you know, provide them space to process any traumatic events, ask questions and express their emotions. Now, while, we're, while parents are doing that for their children, it's important that parents also engage in some processes for themselves. Parents should have conversations with other adults about race and racism and pay attention to any of those emotions that come up. How are you feeling during those conversations? Why are you feeling that way? And reflect on your own ability to help children process race and racism. And if necessary, perhaps do some background work um, for yourself so that you can better prepare your children. And I know I'm um, ending on time, but I wanted to leave with um, some thoughts that I'm having, um, that I'm having, and I'm hoping to move some of this forward. So I would like to encourage us all to think about shifting the narrative from resilience to resistance because resilience is often defined as managing or bouncing back from adversity. And we applaud those um, who are able to cope or manage or withstand adversity, right? We say it's so great that you're resilient. However, we have to interrogate the system that continues to create the adversity in the first place because there's a cost to resilience that um, is not acknowledged. It is, yes, we can be resilient. It's important to be resilient, however, at what cost, especially if we can't, um, if we are constantly in a system that creates the need for us to be res uh, resilient. And so instead we can think about resistance, which Murray and colleagues in their recent paper um, really define as strategies and actions that are used to respond to negotiate dispute and change adverse or challenging situations. And they include some of the strategies that I outlined earlier, such as you know, um, some overt practices uh, and covert practices. Uh, you can use boycotting or demonstrations, but also the persistence or nurturing racial pride. So in other words, we uh, must think through the ways that black families and communities collectively use strategies, not simply to just manage the effects of racism, but the strategies that ultimately reclaim and preserve humanity. And so um, that's all that I have today. I do have some resources um, that I have here that I'm happy to share. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sade. Um, it's really, I think, helpful to add a discussion of race to this conversation and to hear about how um, Black parents in the U.S. are navigating racial ethnic socialization. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing those best practices and also um, that reframe from resilience to resistance. That's really great. Um, and it, it, I think it really relates to a lot of what Amita was talking about too um, in her presentation. There is um, one question in the chat for you. And I think we've built in enough time if you, if you would like to talk about it for two or three minutes and then we can move on to um, Anna's presentation. I don't know if you saw it, Sharday. And 
Oh, you're muted. Should I say? <laughs> that whole time? <laughs> All Sorry. I did is read the question. <laughs> it's okay. All I did is read the question. So if I'm if I'm understanding it correctly, you're asking whether or not we um, are are thinking about the term refusal. Is this in addition to resilience or as a um, form of resilience? I mean, sorry, resistance, not resilience, but resistance. Um, and I think I, I would say refusal is a form of resistance. Um, it's a way to essentially say, I'm not going, uh, uh, kind of rejecting the status quo. I'm not going to engage in some of these practices um, or some of these things that uh, I need to fit in. Uh, it kind of goes with that appropriated racialized oppression piece, right? And so um, it's kind of resisting the fact that I have to um, change who I am to fit into this world. And so I think, I think that is part of that um, refusal that you may be speaking to, but if I'm misunderstanding, please let me know. So yeah, I think it's, it's we haven't used that term, but I think it's, it's wrapped up in appropriated racialized oppression. Thanks so much, Sharday. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so we have one more presentation. Um, Anna, or Anna, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, Kuroska from the University of Warsaw in Poland, um, who's an associate professor and she to us about childcare regimes in Europe from the perspective of unemployed parents. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Amy. I will try to share my screen and to present. Um... Hey, do you see my presentation? Not yet. What we can do is that I can share your presentation as well if it's okay for you and then you just um, let me know let me um, is it all right yeah I, uh, yeah great great okay um let me know if uh they will not change for some reason okay the slides okay. while i'm talking okay so um thank you very much for the invitation and i guess we are now coming back again to europe and to a more aggregate level of analysis um, so I will be talking about uh, childcare regimes in Europe from the perspective uh, in Europe from the perspective of the unemployed parents, and this presentation is based on a paper with Dimitrina Ivanova from University of Work, who is with me here today, uh, and. Um, what is this um, study about so. There has been research uh, for 20 years already about uh, child care regimes or care regimes in Europe and beyond. And uh, what these studies do, they try to identify um, types of uh, policy architectures, so family policy architectures um, with some specific characteristics and diverse um, attitudes, approaches to um, families and to care, especially. Uh, but what is uh, very typical for this research is that all these studies um, are adopting a perspective of an average worker. So there is an assumption that uh, both parents are employed and they rather have a stable employment. So all these um, studies on looking at care regime types in Europe and beyond, they have this perspective of an average worker. And and therefore, the vulnerable families are kind of left out from the from the picture. And our study aimed at looking not only on the um, from the perspective of an average worker, but also from the perspective of unemployed parents. So what we did with Dimitrina was to try to identify um, child care regimes in Europe from the perspective of an average worker family, but also have a look at these regimes from the perspective of more vulnerable parents, so unemployed parents. 
Uh, in our research, we use some new data on childcare availability. We based our um, data on experts assessments, so not like usually um, studies does do. So looking at the coverage rates, so kind kind of outcome indicators, but. Uh, we tried to look at uh, really the availability, assessment of the availability of childcare. Uh, we also apply a temporal perspective. So what is important from our point of view is also to look separately on policies towards uh, care in different age groups of children. So we look at policies for children or for parents uh, when the child is under one year old, then for uh, kids between one and three years old, and then for also for older children. And uh, as we uh, as we show, this is really important because policies differ a lot in terms of um, how they support families, whether they support familial care or rather they support defamilialization. And uh, we also propose some new methods in our study and some new um, ways of visualizing uh, the results. So um, we apply in this study a method called, um, called fuzzy clustering. I will not go into the details what it is. I will just mention that this is a method that combines, on the one hand, um, standard approach, uh, the clustering approach to uh, that, that was applied in um, uh, studies on uh, regime, uh, care regimes. But on the other hand, it, it also um, relates to some uh, fuzziness of fuzzy theory, uh, fuzzy membership, what it means. It means that even if we identify some certain types of policy architectures, then we allow countries to um, have partial membership in these um, uh, in these um, types. Yeah, so there will, of course, be countries that are representative for certain uh, regime, but at the same time, we allow some countries to, um, to be um, a kind of a hybrid case and have um, partial memberships in different um, regimes. So our focus is on two particular uh, perspectives um, or approaches, I would say, uh, to analyze family policies, especially parental policies and childcare policies. So we look uh, to what extent a policy as familializing and whether this is, this is explicit or implicit, what it means for those who are not acquainted with these uh, concepts. So a familialistic policy, explicitly familialistic policy is one that financially and generously supports families in their caring functions. So for example, uh, parental benefits are generous. Yeah, the state, the, 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 the policy supports familial care. So this is explicit familialism. Implicit familialism would, will be in a case where there's no support, neither for the family, nor in terms of formal child care. So no defamilialization. Just, you know, the, the state does not help uh, much. And therefore, by default, the family is actually burdened with childcare, but without much of support from, uh, from the state. There's also a, a second perspective, the genderization or degenderization perspective, where we look at families and uh, 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 family policies, especially parental leave policies, and we try to um, see whether they are addressing their support, they are enforcing a gendered care. So for example, uh, the benefits for mothers are generous, but not 
necessarily uh, the benefits um, and parental leaves, for example, for fathers. And this would be an explicit gender genderization, so supporting um, care um, by, um, provided by mothers, while a policy that is degenderizing would try to provide uh, options for care uh, and financial support for both parents, fathers and mothers in terms of non-transferable um, entitlements. And as I already said in our study, we look at the policy architectures on one hand from the standard perspective of an average worker, but also from a perspective of an employed couple. And today, as we are here focusing in this webinar on um, vulnerable families, uh, I will show you the results for, um, for this perspective uh, of unemployed couple. So this is our family B, so-called family B. And here, I, I, yes? I'm sorry, we just aren't able to see your um, screen move. It's still on the title. Oh, oh okay. Now it just moved, actually, whatever you just clicked. It, just mo uh, it moved. Okay, so now you see the indicators, I guess. Oh, yeah, okay, great. We see the previous research slide right now. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Okay, I think uh, there's some delay. Um, I think it's actually coming from my computer now. Oh, Do you want it? me to stop sharing and you start sharing? No, Mia, please share it. But yeah. I, so I will be telling you what to uh, where to, when to click. Okay. So okay, this is something that I already told you. Okay, great. And this is something that I started to talk, talk about. Okay, so yeah. great. So Mia, please, uh, if you could help me with uh, the slides, it would Next. be great. Yes. Okay, so uh, here you can see the, um, the indicators that we use in our study. So I will focus on um, mentioning the indicators for the analysis from the perspective of family B, so the unemployed couple. So as you see here, we included in the analysis two indicators. Uh, the second indicator uh, relates to the payments, so the uh, generosity of the parental benefits that are provided for families after they, um, they had a child. Uh, usually, of course, uh, parental benefits are related to parental leaves, which are um, addressed to employed parents. But more and more countries are providing also some parental benefits for unemployed parents. So here we wanted to uh, take account of this. Uh, and we look at these benefits separately for children at the age of, uh, under one year, uh, year um, uh, when they are under one year of, uh, of age. And then we also look at uh, children between one and three years of age. And we also have an indicator of genderization. So as I mentioned already, we try to see whether these uh, benefits are addressed to mothers mostly, or they are transferable. So, fathers can easily transfer their rights to mothers, or this is really the gender rights, so uh, it means that both mothers and fathers are provided non-transferable and uh, non-transferable uh, transfer um, uh, benefits. And then, uh, please click, Mia, uh, then we have two indicators of related to childcare. So first one relates to childcare availability. So how accessible are is formal childcare for children under one, uh, between one and three, and, and um, when they are three uh, to five years old. So we have three separate indicators here. And finally, we have also an indicator that shows us whether the uh, childcare is somehow prioritized 
uh, towards um, employed parents. So whether employed parents have some uh, like stronger entitlement to, or they have a priority of access to uh, formal uh, childcare. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Okay, and here I'm showing you the results of our analysis for the family B, so a perspective of an unemployed couple. We were able to identify six uh, different regimes, care regimes. I will not go into very uh, details of each regime, but um, we'll focus on um, the main characteristics of the six regime. So the first regime here uh, in red, this is a regime uh, where there is um, moderate support for familial care. And at the same time, it is degenderized. So you can see it uh, in the bottom of this red figure that both the second parent uh, as well as the birth parent are granted some non-transferable um, benefits. Uh, and also the support for um, uh, external care, so in form of formal child care, uh, it's quite widespread. So, widespread. so there is um, a widespread child care availability in that, uh, in that regime. The second regime, the orange one uh, is characterized by a very little support for familial care. So for parents uh, caring, um, um, caring for their children at home, uh, very little support. So I would say that this um, system, we would say that this system is uh, an early implicit uh, familialism. So from on, early on, this is really the care is by default um, a responsibility of a family and it's not supported by, um, by the state. The third model, the third prototype, as we call it uh, in our, in our um, paper, um, this is a regime with moderate uh, financial support for familial care, but what is important is that uh, this support is addressed mostly to mothers, so it's very gendered. In this regime, we also find some um, support for former care, but mostly for elder children, so preschool children at the age of three to five. The fourth regime, uh, is kind of implicit, um, um, implicitly gendered familialism. Why? Because on one hand, the uh, benefits are not addressed necessarily to the mother, but they are transferable. So, and we know that if the benefits, if the entitlements are transferable, then it will be mothers who will be using them. And uh, then the uh, fifth regime, it's uh, compared to the previous one, we see that the support is a little bit uh, stronger and there's also wider availability of childcare uh, for, ch for younger children. So at the age of one to three. And the last regime is, again, characterized by uh, strong support for, so explicit uh, support for familial care and very little support uh, for uh, child care, formal child care uh, at actually any age, almost any age. Okay, so now let's have a look how countries in Europe, um, what is the membership of, of different countries in Europe in these um, six um, uh, prototypes, prototypical, I would say, regimes. 
Um, so we can easily see, and now if you, if you, Mia, you could click um, um, subsequently um, some, yeah. Okay, yeah, so here we see that in the first regime, that is actually the only regime that provides some degendered uh, support. Uh, we have two countries here that are clearly representative of this regime and uh, one country or maybe uh, two, three countries that are partially um, in that regime. But the representative countries are Spain and Iceland. Uh, we, um, and I could now and I can now already comment that it's quite unusual to have these uh, two countries together. This also already shows that the classification, the groupings of countries are very diff different in case uh, when we look from the perspective of unemployed uh, couple um, than when we look at the standard perspective of an average worker. Uh, Mia, could you could you click now? So next um, regime, the uh, implicit familialism um, is represented by Luxembourg, Serbia, Italy, Ireland, and Greece. Then the next uh, group um, represents, so this is um, Bulgaria and Belgium. Again, not very typical um, classification of these two countries together. Um, next, so this is the represent, these are two, two representative countries of the th uh, third regime, so uh, explicitly genderized uh, regime. And then we have uh, another um, uh, group of countries, so uh, Slovakia, Hungary, Czechia, and um, Austria. This is this implicitly genderized regime. Then um, a two countries, Sweden and Denmark, representative of an implicitly uh, de-genderizing uh, um, familialism. And then finally, UK and Croatia in the final, uh, the last regime, um, which was explicitly familializing without much support for external childcare. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, to stress the fact that it's really important to um, start to look at policies, family policies, and identifying um, childcare regime also from the perspective of an unemployed couple is that, as I already mentioned, that gr country groupings are very different than um, than uh, when we look at from the perspective of an average worker. We are now very um, acquainted with these standard classification of Scandinavian countries, CE countries. On the left-hand side of this um, slide, you see that CE countries are, are mostly uh, um, clustered together also in our um, study, we see that when we look from the average worker perspective, uh, they tend to cluster, uh, they, they, they tend to be grouped together. And when we look from the uh, perspective of unemployed couple, the picture is much more diverse. So the C countries are dispersed through very diverse types of um, types of regimes. And can we now move to the next slide? So what are the general conclusions from our study? Uh, first of all, um, we see that many countries already uh, provide some parental benefits for unemployed parents uh, in Europe. 10, 20 years ago, there was mostly nothing, there was actually almost nothing for unemployed parents. Today, we have more and more countries that provide some support, financial support for uh, unemployed parents as well. However, uh, the implicitness of familialism is quite widespread. 
And this is in contrast to the perspective of an average worker. So if, you, if we look at the family policies, care policy from the perspective of an um, average worker, we see much more of explicit familial support. In case of unemployed parents, it's much, the, the, the support is much more implicit. Secondly, we see a genderization of parental benefits uh, when we look from the perspective of uh, the unemployed couple. And it's both explicit in some regimes as well as implicit in some other regimes. This is also characteristic and contrast and in contrast to the perspective of an average worker couple. And finally, uh, what is interesting 20 years ago, in one of the seminar works on childcare regimes in Europe, uh, Sigrid Leitner identified an optional familialism. So a regime, a theoretical um, a regime that offers a, an option for parents, either to care for uh, their children, and children at home or to uh, use formal childcare. From our study, we can show that actually there is no much of optional familialism in Europe, neither from the perspective of unemployed couple, nor from the perspective of a standard family case, so average uh, worker. And me, I want to uh, click more. Uh, um, again, I would like to mention that that this known country groupings, this uh, country groupings into the Scandinavian CE, continental Europe, etc., southern Europe, uh, are distorted, are very different uh, in, when we look at the childcare regimes in Europe from the perspective of unemployed couple. So, uh, and I hope that you now became convinced that it's also important to look and study care regimes from the perspective of vulnerable groups, for example, as we did from the perspective of unemployed couple. But I'm also sure that we could look at the um, at the care regimes from the perspective of um, of different um, vulnerable groups, not only from the perspective of an unemployed couple. Uh, what we did. And this is all that I wanted to say uh, when reporting the results of our study, but uh, I would like to um, also mention to you, as I've seen that uh, many of you are interested in vulnerable families and the concept of resilience, actually, that I'm also part of a very different project that is called that is called resilience, and to, in that project we study the resilience of families, which we define much more broadly than just uh, the ability to bounce back from uh, bounce back from a difficult situations, adverse uh, situations. So um, I really liked uh, Professor Smith's uh, discussion about uh, maybe the need to shift uh, the, um, the resilience concept into the resistant concept. I would not be so much convinced about that, but I, I'm, I'm uh, certainly con uh, convinced on the fact that we have to uh, look at resilience uh, with a broader lens. So it's not only about bouncing back, uh, it's uh, um, something much more important. So in this, much more broad, so it's also about um, being able to transform your, your um, life uh, into a better life and not only bouncing back. And it's also about policies that support resilience of families. So if you are interested in these topics, please visit our um, uh, website, the resilience.eu. Uh, this week on Monday, we have just 
a published national reports from focus group interviews that were carried in all six countries that participate in uh, this project. So I hope that you will find a lot of interesting uh, material, uh, material there. And of course, I um, I encourage you to uh, to look at our website from time to time, as we will be um, publishing more and more results from other work packages, not only the uh, group interviews there. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you so much, um, Anna. That was that was really wonderful. I love hearing about. Um, the different prototypes, and I, I really appreciate the developmental and gender lenses that you all used in that project. Um, and for someone from the United States, it's very helpful for me to understand more the variation in policy across uh, Europe. So thank you. Um, so just to kind of close here, um, I just want to thank again, Amita, Sharday, and Anna for sharing about your research. And um, I think taken together, there's clearly um, a pattern of the importance of intersectionality when we think about family vulnerability and stressors and um, the need to consider race and gender and other family identities when we're thinking about economic insecurity. Um, and certainly there's a lot of variation between and within countries in terms of families experiences and abilities to navigate towards resources. Um, and I really feel inspired around um, continuing to advocate for policy changes to improve supports for vulnerable families um, and also engagement in qualitative research um, to emphasize families' challenges and needs, but also their strengths. Um, and Amita, your project in particular is just really inspiring around um, empowering families in vulnerable situations. So um, thank you very much. I don't know, Mia, if you have anything you'd like yeah. to add. Yeah, just to add thanks from my behalf as well. I thought it was um, uh, quite different topics, but really uh, interesting. And they all kind of nicely intersect in the, in the end of the day. I, I've written so many notes for myself, for example, care economy and how we think of care and how we have to look at care policies uh, and how those uh, play together in, in people's lives coming from different backgrounds, for example, from unemployed parents or uh, people from different racial backgrounds and so on. And also how we unfortunately create high risk situations and we create that vulnerability. I think that's kind of a, one of the takeaway messages that I took. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um it, it was very intense, two hours, I have to say, but really inspiring. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. I will see.